This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so now we are going to see about the Narma lateralis. You know, viewing of the skull from the lateral side is called as the Narma lateralis. Usually the external features of the skull are studied in five different aspects. So already we have seen the Narma frontalis. So today we are going to learn about the Narma lateralis. Okay, so the bones forming the Narma lateralis are uh, the, actually, the lateral part is formed partly by facial bones and partly by cranial bones. You know the names of all these bones. So you can uh, see the picture here. This is the frontal, parietal, temporal, squamous part of temporal, occipital, spinoid, and this is the zygomatic bone, and here is the lacrimal bone, this is the nasal bone, this is the maxilla, and this is the mandible. Okay, so now all these bones contribute to the formation of the Narma lateralis. So you can see uh, the sutures in the Narma lateralis. Actually, you can see the most important suture here is the coronal suture. So the next suture will be the temporoparietal suture. And the third one here will be the occipitomastoid suture. And the fourth one here is the temporozygomatic suture, which joins the zygomatic uh, process of temporal bone and the uh, temporal process of zygomatic bone and you can see the zygomatic maxillary suture here and the sixth one you can see the frontonasal suture and the seventh one this is the spinofrontal suture eighth is spinoparietal suture and ninth one the last one here is the spinosquamosal suture okay so with this, I'll continue into the Narma lateralis. So Narma lateralis is studied in different regions. So first we'll see about the bones forming Narma lateralis, the main bones contributing to the far, uh, Narma. As I already said, you can see the squamous part of the uh, parietal bone, and you can see the temporal bone, and you can see the greater wing of sphenoid and zygomatic arch, and the temporal bone, which has a mastoid process, external acoustic meatus, stylite process. So we are going to read normal lateralis in different regions. So out of this, the first region, uh, what we are going to read is the temporal fossa. Okay, so the temporal fossa, you know, it is situated on each side of the head, above in front of the auricle. Your auricle will be here. So it is situated on each side of the head, above and in front. And actually, this is called temporal region. The temporal fossa is the floor of this region. So this temporal fossa communicates below with the infratemporal fossa. That is below the temporal bone. The region here is called as the infratemporal region. That is medial to the ramus of the mandible. Okay. Uh, you can see in coronal section, the temporal fossa is communicating with the infratemporal fossa through a gap here. Okay. So the temporal fossa is limited above by the superior temporal line. Okay. Now we'll see the boundaries of the temporal region. Okay. So the boundaries of the temporal region are, uh, if you see, so it is above, it is bounded by the superior temporal line. This is the superior temporal line. Below it is limited by the zygomatic arch. As I said previously, the zygomatic arch is formed by the Temporal process of zygomatic bone and the zygomatic process of temporal bone. Okay. And posteriorly, if you see the limitation of the temporal fossa, it is limited by the inferior temporal line and supramastoid crest. So anteriorly, it is limited by the zygomatic and frontal bone. You can see the zygomatic frontal suture here. Okay. So I think you are clear about the boundaries of the temporal fossa. So we'll continue with the, so next thing. Uh, so next will be the floor of the temporal fossa. The floor of the temporal fossa is mainly contributed by the parietal bone and the squamous part of the frontal bone and the greater wing of sphenoid and the squamous part of the temporal bone. So you can see the zygomatic arch here and the temporal lines here. Okay, so next. If you see what are the important features of the temporal fossa, the one most important feature is the terion. Okay, so it is uh, situated in the floor of the temporal fossa. It is an H-shaped suture where four bones meet here. Okay, 
So what are the four bones? This is the frontal bone and this is the parietal bone. You can see the greater wing of the sphenoid and this is the temporal bone. So this H-shaped suture is called as the terion. So the center point of terion is situated just to 4 centimeter above the zygomatic arch and 3.5 centimeter behind the frontozygomatic suture. Okay. So if you see the uh, part of the cranium in this part, it is very thin. And actually this uh, part of terion is uh, behind this, it is immediately related to the anterior division of middle meningeal artery and vein. And, uh, and it is also related to the stem of the lateral sulcus of the brain. Okay, you can see the landmark in this picture, two finger breadth above the zygomatic arch and one finger breadth behind the frontozygomatic suture. Okay, that is four centimeter above the zygomatic arch and 3.5 centimeter behind the frontozygomatic suture. So it is a very important landmark. Tyrion is a very important landmark. So if you fall from height or from a motorbike or any accidents, so if uh, you are injured in this plane, the actually since the cranium is very thin, the bone will get fractured immediately and there will be tear of the middle meningeal vein and this is an artery and this is results in extradural hematoma. Okay. So the this the meeting of all the suture here, this point is called as the sylvian point. Okay. So you know the other name for lateral sulcus is the sylvian uh, sulcus or sylvian fissure. That's why it is called sylvian point. Okay. I think you are clear about the terion. So next we'll go on about the other features of the temporal fossa. So you can see the zygomatic arch here. Actually, this uh, temporal line it starts at the root of the zygomatic process of the frontal bone here and it diverge as they go posteriorly into two lines. One is the superior temporal line, another one is the inferior temporal line. Usually the superior temporal line, when it curves uh, posteriorly inferiorly, it fades away. But inferior temporal line, it continues anteriorly as the supramastoid crest here and it continues with the posterior root of the zygomatic arch. Okay. So you can see this two lines here, superior and inferior temporal line, which is nothing but the continuation of the zygomatic process of the frontal bone here. So behind the superior temporal line fades away, the inferior temporal line continues as a supramastoid crest. Okay, in the next picture you can see, so this is the supramastoid crest, you can see the inferior temporal line clearly. And the superior temporal line behind here, you can see it fades away, there is no continuation below this part into the anterior part. Okay. I think you are clear about the superior and inferior temporal line. So next we'll go on to the zygomatic arch. Okay. So the zygomatic arch, actually it is also otherwise called zygoma. It is located in front of the ear, a little above the tragus. You know what is tragus? Uh, you have auricle or pinna, no? So in front of the auricle, you can see a leaf-like fold that is called as the tragus. So the zygomatic arch is located just in front of the, in front and above the tragus. Okay. So you know, as I already said, the zygomatic arch is formed by the temporal process of the zygomatic bone and the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Okay. So actually you can see the suture in between the zygomatic arch. This is a zygomatic or temporal suture. Okay. So actually the weakest point of the arch is located just behind the suture where usually the fracture will take place. Actually, uh, this is crossed by the superficial temporal, the zygomatic arch here, it is crossed by the superficial temporal vessel and the auriculotemporal nerve. And it is one of the important region for the anesthetist uh, who will feel the pulse during surgeries because in front of the here, if, uh, in front of the tragus, if you put your tip of the finger uh, here, you can feel the pulsation of the superficial temporal artery here. Okay, so um, uh, this is about the zygomatic arch. You know the zygomatic arch above it continues um, with this uh, temporal line. Behind it continues with the supramastoid press and it has an upper margin and the lower margin. The upper margin gives attachment to the temporal fascia and the lower margin it gives attachment to the meseter muscle. Okay. 
so that's all about the zygomatic arch. So other than this, you can see um, many other features of zygomatic arch. Actually, the zygomatic arch, if, if you see the lower margin, so it, when it goes in front of the uh, head of the mandible, it forms an articular tubercle. You can see an articular tubercle. And here is the post glenar tubercle. These are the two features. Actually, um, and above uh, this, behind the external acoustic meatus, you can see a projection here. This is called the supramatal spine. Okay. Now we'll see about the fate of the zygomatic arch. Actually, the zygomatic arch, when you traced backwards the lower margin, it divides into two roots. One is the anterior root, another one is the posterior root. So this is the anterior root, and this is the posterior root. Okay. So the junction of the anterior root with the lower margin forms an articular tubercle or eminence. Okay. So you know which gives attachment to lateral ligament of the temporomandibular joint. And uh, you can see the uh, posterior root here. This is the posterior root. So the posterior root, it, it continues uh, uh, posteriorly. And here you can see in one more enlargement. This is called post glenoid tubercle as you have seen uh, in the lateral view. Okay. So this is the articular tubercle and this is the post glenoid tubercle. Okay. So this anterior root and posterior root, it encloses the mandibular fossa. So this is the mandibular fossa. This mandibular fossa has an anterior articular part, which is formed by the squamous part of the temporal bone. So which articulates with the head of the mandible to form the temporomandibular joint. And, and the posterior non-articular part is formed by the tympanic plate of the temporal bone, so which is non-articular here. So clear about the zygomatic arch, the lower margin of the zygomatic arch, it divides into anterior root, posterior root. It encloses the mandibular fossa. So the anterior root has an anterior tubercle, articular tubercle or eminence. The posterior root ends with the postglenoid tubercle. Okay. So this uh, mandibular fossa has an articular part and non-articular part. Articular part articulates with the head of the mandible. Okay. So now we'll go on to the um, articular fossa. You can see the articular fossa here and the articular tubercle. So in between the mandibular fossa and the tympanic plate, you can see a fissure. So this fissure is called squamotympanic fissure. So this part of the bone is the squamous part of the temporal bone. And this is the tympanic plate of the temporal bone. So in between two, you can see a fissure. This fissure is called squamotympanic fissure. Actually, which is divided into two parts by the uh, edge of the tegment tympani. Tegment tympani is a part of temporal bone again, which you can see in the floor of the middle cranial fossa, actually in the anterior part of the petrous part of temporal bone. So which divides the squamotympanic fissure into two parts, petrosquamous and petrotympanic. Okay. So this petrotympanic fissure, it transmits three structures. One, are, one is the cauda tympani nerve, which is a branch of facial nerve, anterior ligament of malleus, which is a, again a derivative of first pharyngeal arch. And next one will be the anterior tympanic branch of the maxillary arch. So I think you are clear about the zygomatic arch. So up to this, I think you are clear. Okay. If you have any doubt, you can clear at the end. Okay. So I'll continue with the next part of the normal lateralis. Okay. So in the next part of the normal lateralis is the external acoustic meatus. This is the external acoustic meatus. Okay. So the external acoustic meatus is located just below the posterior root of the zygomatic arch here and behind the mandibular fossa. So it is mainly formed by the tympanic plate of the temporal bone. So on all sides, except its roof and the postero superior wall, which is formed by the squamous part of the temporal bone. Okay, so the external acoustic meatus is formed on all sides by the tympanic plate of temporal bone, except its roof and postero superior wall, which is formed by the squamous part of the temporal bone. So the, if you see the irregular margin of the external acoustic meatus, which gives attachment to the cartilaginous part of the meatus. Actually, the external acoustic meatus, you have the cartilaginous part and the bony part. 
So what you are seeing is the bony part of the external acoustic mattress. The cartilaginous part will be removed in the bone and this cartilaginous part will continue with the auricle or the pinna. Okay. So behind the external acoustic meatus, okay, uh, are in front of the mastoid process. You can see a fissure here. So this fissure is called tympanomastoid fissure, so which transmits the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. Okay. So uh, you are clear about the external acoustic meatus? No doubt, no. Okay. So I'll continue with the other features of the external me acoustic meatus. Okay, so if you see, this is the ex external acoustic meatus. So uh, there is a part which lies posterior superior to the external acoustic meatus. This part is called the supramatal triangle or um, McEwen's triangle. Okay, it is otherwise called McEwen's triangle. Okay, so um, actually it is an important surgical landmark for ear surgery. And the mastoid andrum, which is a part of the middle ear, lies 1.25 cm deep to this triangle. So if you see the boundaries of the supramatal triangle, so you can see a triangle here. So the above, uh, it is uh, formed by the supramastoid crest. And in front, that is anterior, it is formed by the posterior superior margin of the external acoustic meatus. And posteriorly, it is formed by a vertical tangent along the posterior margin of the meatus. So these are the boundaries of the supramatal triangle. Once again, I am repeating. So it is a triangular region. It is located posterior superior to meatus. Okay. So where the mastoid andrum lies, 1.25 cm deep to this triangle. And it is bounded above by the supramastoid crest anteriorly by the posterior superior margin of external acoustic meatus, behind by the vertical transient along the posterior margin of the meatus. Okay, so clear. So actually, um, um, you can uh, see the position of the supramatal triangle along the simba concha of the auricle, which is a depression in the uh, auricle, auricle below the crest of the helix. Okay. So actually, um, if you see uh, what is the surgical importance means, actually, if there is any abscess in the middle ear, it can be drained through the strand. Okay, the pus in the mastoid andrum can be drained through the strand. That is the clinical importance of the supramatal triangle. Okay, so I think you are clear about the supramatal triangle. It is a, it's a very important uh, structure, okay, important landmark during your surgeries okay so next we'll go on to the next region of the normal lateralis so far we have seen the temporal fossa zygomatic arch and external acoustic meatus so the next region what we are going to see is a stylomastoid region so this has two parts one is the mastoid part and other one will be the stylite part so first we'll see about the mastoid part of the stylomastoid region okay so you can see the mastoid uh, part that is located just uh, behind the external acoustic meatus so uh, there will be a projection from the master conical projection from the mastoid part this is called as the mastoid process which is filled with numerous um air follicles okay uh, so um, actually um if you see, uh, this mastoid process will be absent and birth and will develops after the second year only. Okay. And behind the mastoid process, you can see the junction of the three sutures here. One is what is the name of the suture? This suture is the temporoparietal suture, and here is the parieto occipital suture, and this is the uh, temporo occipital suture here, or masto occipital suture. So the meeting point of this suture, this three point is called as the asterion. Okay. So the asterion on the inner aspect, it is related to the sigmoid sinus. Okay. I think you are, you will remember this part. Okay. So clear about the mastoid process. So the mastoid process, nothing but a conical projection from the mastoid part. So this consists of mucus lined air cells which communicate with the tympanic cavity through the mastoid andrum okay so the external uh, part of the mastoid process gives origin to the sternocleidomastoid muscle 
splenius capitis and longissimus capitis muscle okay and you can see the important landmark here that is the asterion and one foramen behind the mastoid process is called as the mastoid foramen okay so which transmits an emissary vein from the sigmoid sinus so in front of the external acoustic meatus you can see the temporomandibular joint okay so uh, you are clear about the mastoid part next we'll see the inferior view of the mastoid process so you can see the mastoid process this is the mastoid process here this is the tympanic plate of the temporal bone here is the external acoustic meatus okay so you uh, just uh, posterior to the mastoid notch you can see posterior and anterior you can see a notch here this is called mastoid notch so which gives origin to the posterior belly of the digastric muscle and behind that you can see a groove this groove transmits the occipital artery which is a branch of the external carotid artery and you can even see the mastoid foramen behind this notch and the groove so i think now you are clear about the mastoid part so next we'll go on to the next part of the stylomastoid region that is the styloid process which is a very important uh, structure sometimes it will be asked as a five mark question okay so the styloid process you can see this is a 2.5 cm long slender projection which is located deep to the external acoustic meatus okay if you see the direction of the styloid process is directed downwards and forward and you can see it is ensheathed by the tympanic plate of the temporal bone the temp uh, tympanic plate of the temporal bone it ensheathes the root of the styloid process you can see the styloid process here actually if you see the styloid process um i uh, will be covered by the parotid gland okay uh, you cannot see the styloid process uh, when you if you feel you have to feel um, uh, just below the angle of the mandible if you put pressure on that it's very difficult to feel uh, you can try if it is long more than 2.5 cm long sometimes you can feel the styloid process just behind the angle of the mandible okay and uh, actually uh, you can see in this picture so this actually the styloid process uh, is located just uh, in front of the external acoustic vein deep to it okay and uh, you can see this there will be a fissure here that is the what is the name of this fissure this is the masto tympanic fissure which stands with the auricular branch of facial nerve and there will be a foramen uh behind the styloid process the name of this foramen is the stylomastoid foramen because it is located between styloid process and mastoid process this is called stylomastoid foramen which transmits the facial nerve and the stylomastoid artery so both are derivatives of the second uh, branchial arch okay so it is related to the facial nerve the styloid process is related to the facial nerve and if you see medially and deep to the styloid process it is related to internal carotid artery in front and behind will be your internal jugular vein in between this two structure you have the last four cranial or 9 10 11 and 12 actually just below that it is enclosed by the carotid sheath okay so clear about the relations of the styloid process okay so next we'll go on to the attachments of the styloid process so the styloid process it gives attachment to two ligaments and three muscles okay so hence it is called styloid apparatus okay so what are the two ligaments it gives attachment the one first ligament is a stylohyoid ligament so you can see the tip of the styloid process is attached to the lesser corner of the hyoid bone so this ligament is called stylohyoid ligament another ligament is the stylomandibular ligament so it is attached between the styloid process and the angle of the mandible okay which separates the parotid gland from the submandibular salivary gland so uh, these are the two ligaments which is uh, you uh, attachment um, which is attached to the styloid process then what are the three muscles attached to the styloid process so the first muscle you can see here is the styloglossus muscle glossus means tongue so it connects the styloid process to the tongue okay so which is supplied by the hypoglossal nerve which is the 12th cranial nerve and the next muscle is the stylohyoid muscle which is attached to the hyoid bone here 
so which is supplied by the patient no so it is a derivative of the second pharyngeal arch and the next muscle behind you can see the stylo pharyngeus muscle which is attached to the pharynx wall of the pharynx so it is um, actually supplied by the glossopharyngeal pharyngeal no? it is a derivative of third pharyngeal arch okay so each muscle is supplied by uh, supplied by different cranial nerve okay so styloid apparatus is nothing but styloid process with attachments of two ligaments and two three muscles is called a styloid apparatus the two ligaments are stylohyoid ligament stylomandibular ligament and three muscles are styloglossus stylohyoid and stylopharyngeus okay so i hope you uh, understood about the styloid apparatus so next we'll go on to the next part of the norma lateralis um i think i can continue so the next part of the norma lateralis is the infratemporal fossa okay so infratemporal fossa as i already said it is an irregular space located behind the maxilla below the temporal bone here so this part is called as the infratemporal fossa actually through a gap uh, between the zygomatic arch it communicates above with the temporal fossa so there will be communication between temporal fossa and infratemporal fossa so in this gap only the temporalis muscle which is attached to the floor of the temporal region enters the infratemporal region and gets attached to the coronoid process of the mandible okay now we'll see about the boundaries of the infratemporal fossa okay so first we'll see the anterior boundary so the green color bone here is the maxilla bone so which forms the anterior boundary of infratemporal fossa that is mainly it is formed by the posterior surface of the body of the maxilla this is the posterior surface of the body of maxilla which forms the anterior boundary of infratemporal fossa posteriorly if you see it is formed by the styloid process and even you can tell the carotid sheath also as the posterior boundary of the infratemporal fossa okay and if you see the medial boundary this is the sphenoid bone you can see the extension this is the pterygoid process this plate is called lateral pterygoid plate so the medial boundary of the infratemporal fossa is formed by lateral pterygoid plate okay and laterally if you see the lateral boundary of infratemporal fossa is formed by the ramus of the mandible okay and if you see the roof the roof is formed by the sphenoid bone mainly the under surface of the greater ring of the sphenoid bone okay and the floor is open okay the floor is open okay and these are the boundaries of the infratemporal fossa once again i am repeating anteriorly it is formed by maxilla posteriorly by styloid process and carotid sheath medially will be the lateral pterygoid plate and laterally will be the ramus of the mandible the roof is formed by the sphenoid bone and the floor is open okay so it has a fissure between the pterygoid process and maxilla this fissure is called pterygo maxillary fissure so through this fissure the infratemporal fossa communicates with the pterygo palatine fossa so this is the fissure inside there will be a fossa here this is called pterygo palatine fossa and you can see a fissure above the maxilla so this fissure is called inferior orbital fissure so through this fissure it communicates with the orbit okay so other than this there will be a foramen uh, opening into the infrared and there is a foramen ovid so through this opening it communicates with middle cranial fossa so these are the communications of the infratemporal fossa so uh, anyway in the next session i will uh, take detail about the infratemporal fossa okay so we'll continue with the perigo palatine fossa okay so this is the next part of the norma lateralis so the perigo palatine fossa as i already said it is deep to the perigo maxillary fissure it is an inverted tear drop or pyramidal shaped space situated below the this is the orbit so it is situated below the apex of the orbit between bones on the lateral side of the skull immediately posterior to the maxilla okay so i think you are clear about the location it is located immediately posterior to maxilla just below the apex of the orbit so actually the walls are mainly here formed by the three bones so what are the bones maxilla 
spinae bone and palatine bone okay so before going into the boundaries of the pterygopalatine fossa you have to know some features of the uh, this three bones palatine maxilla and spinae so first we will see about the spinae bone so the spinae bone you can see this is the inferior view of the skull you can see this green colored bone is the spinae bone so you know some of the parts this part is the greater wing of the spinae and this is the pterygoid process of the spinae okay and you can see two foramen in the spinae this is the foramen ovale and foramen spinosum so the pterygoid process has two plates medial pterygoid plate and lateral pterygoid plate okay and you can see in this picture this is the anterior view of the spinae bone showing the root of the pterygoid process so you can see two plates lateral pterygoid plate and the medial pterygoid plate and this is the root of the pterygoid process and you can see the lesser wing here this is the greater wing the gap here is the superior orbital fissure okay so this is the spinoidal crust okay spinoidal crust so in the next picture you can see again the anterior view of spinoid bone only so the colored part here is related to the pterygopalatine fossa so the colored part you can see this so this is the colored area okay so this part is related to the pterygopalatine fossa you can see there are foramen in this what foramen the one foramen here is the foramen rotundum another opening is a pterygoid canal and you have a palato vaginal groove also so these are the three openings you can see in the uh, floor of the pterygopalatine fossa that is a part of spinae bone okay so in the, this picture is again the inferior view of the spinae bone this is the anterior view of the spinae bone and this is the inferior view of the spinae bone so same thing you can see here lesser wing this is the greater wing and here this is the pterygoid process okay so this picture will be little bit confusing only but you can just orient so this is the foramen ovale and this is the foramen spinosum this part here is related to the pterygopalatine fossa here okay so with this i'll continue on to the next bone so in the next bone will be the maxilla bone so the maxilla bone you know it has four process one is the frontal process alveolar process and it has a zygomatic process and it has a palatine process and it has a body so the body has an orbital surface nasal surface here and posterior to the nasal surface you can see a opening this is called maxillary hiatus which has the maxillary sinus in it in it and it has a palatine surface also this is the palatine surface okay so and this is the anterior surface of the body of the maxilla and this is the posterior surface of the body of the maxilla so this part forms the uh, boundary of the pterygopalatine fossa i think now you are clear and you can see the hard palate the posterior one third of the hard palate is formed by palatine bone anterior two third is formed by the palatine process of the maxilla bone and this surface is the posterior surface of the body of the maxilla okay so with this i'll continue and you can see a fissure here this is the inferior orbital fissure this fissure here is the pterygo maxillary fissure and you can see the pterygoid plate also okay there will be a projection from the medial pterygoid plate this projection is called pterygoid hamulus okay so i will take detail about the norma basalis in another session okay so now i'll continue with the next bone palatine bone you can see the palatine bone here so the palatine bone as i already said it forms the posterior one third of the hard palate so which consists of vertical plate or perpendicular plate and horizontal plate so there are two plates one is the perpendicular plate or vertical plate and this is the horizontal plate so the horizontal part of the palatine bone meets and it forms the posterior one third of the palate hard palate and this is the interpalatal suture and this is the palato maxillary suture okay and you can see other process also there are two process one process is the orbital process and other one will be the spinoidal process so just see the i have rotated this uh, this is uh, you can see the uh, upside down of the palatine bone so you can see this horizontal plate here articulates to form the posterior one third of the palatine bone okay so now i think you are clear about the 
palatine bone. One more process I left. This process between the maxilla and the pterygoid plate here is called as a pyramidal process. So totally there are three processes of the palatine bone: orbital process, spinal process, and pyramidal process. Okay. So clear. Now we'll go on to the pterygo palatine fossa boundaries. Okay. So I think uh, you are clear with this picture. We have removed the zygomatic arch here. You can see the posterior surface of a uh, body of maxilla, later pterygoid plate, and this is a root of the pterygoid process, and this is the greater wing of the spinoid bone. Okay. Now the anterior wall of the pterygo palatine fossa is formed by the upper part of the posterior surface of maxilla. Okay. And the posterior wall is formed by the root of the pterygoid process, an adjoining part of the anterior surface of the greater wing of spinae. Okay, so this is the root of the pterygoid process, and this is the anterior surface of the greater wing of the spinae, so which forms the posterior wall. Okay, so next we'll go on to the medial wall. So this picture you can see, this is the medial wall, so which is formed by the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone with its orbital and sphenoidal process okay and if you see the lateral wall the lateral wall of the pterygo palatine fossa is open into the infratemporal fossa through pterygo maxillary fissure so clear okay so next we will go on to the superior boundary of the pterygo this is a Superior boundary, which is formed by the under surface of the body of the spinoid with its orbital process, and inferiorly it is formed by the pyramidal process of the palatine bone. Okay, so now I think you are clear about the boundaries of the pterygo palatine fossa. So once again, I am repeating: see this picture. Anteriorly, it is uh, formed by the upper part of the posterior surface of body of maxilla. Posteriorly, it is formed by the root of the uh, pterygoid process and adjoining anterior surface of greater wing of sphenoid. Okay, so the medial wall is formed by the perpendicular plate of palatine bone, and later wall is uh, open and communicates with the infratemporal fossa through pterygo maxillary fissure. Superiorly, it is formed by under surface of body of sphenoid, inferiorly, it is formed by the pyramidal process of palatine bone. Okay. So that's all about the boundaries of the palatine fossa. So you can see the pyramidal process. This is uh, just uh, showing the hard palate. You can see the pyramidal process here. Okay. And this is lateral pterygoid plate. Okay. So you can see a foramen here. This is the greater palatine foramen. And this uh, actually behind the third molar teeth, you can see an elevation here. This elevation is called the maxillary tuberosity. Okay. And you can see both the horizontal plates posteriorly, it uh, joins and forms a projection. It's called posterior nasal spine. Okay. So we'll go on to the openings in the pterygo palatine fossa. You can see numerous openings in the wall here. This is the pterygo palatine fossa. So, what are the openings? As we can see in the enlarged view of this uh, picture. So, the medial wall, you can see an opening here. This opening is called spino palatine foramen. So through this foramen, it communicates with the nasal cavity. So this transmits the spinopalatine vessels and nerves. Okay. So otherwise, it is called nasopalatine vessels and nerve. And in the posterior wall, you have three openings. One opening is the foramen rotundum, which transmits the maxillary nerve. Through this, it communicates with the middle cranial fossa. Another opening below this will be the pterygoid canal. Okay. So this pterygoid canal transfers the pterygoid vessels and nerve. Okay. Then next will be the palatovaginal canal, so which transfers the pharyngeal vessels and nerve. Through this, it communicates with the pharynx. Okay. So now we have seen through medial wall with, through spinopalatine foramen, it communicates with the nasal cavity. Through foramen rotundum, it communicates with middle cranial fossa. Through pterygoid canal and palatovaginal canal, it communicates with the pharynx, mainly oropharynx. Okay, so in this you can see in the near the apex of the uh, thing, uh, you can see here in the hot palate, this foramen is a greater palatine foramen. So this uh, near the apex of the fossa, this opening is called greater palatine foramen and you have lesser palatine for this is a lesser palatine, this is a greater palatine foramen which transmits the greater palatine vessels and nerves 
and lesser palatine foramen transfers the lesser palatine vessels and now so through this it again communicates with the pharynx okay and even it communicates with the nasal cavity also so these are the openings and communications of the pterygo palatine fossa so and you know through pterygo maxillary fissure it communicates with the infra temporal fossa through inferior orbital fissure it communicates with the floor of the orbit okay so these are the communications of the pterygo palatine fossa okay so through greater and lesser palatine foramen it communicates with oro pharynx and also with the oral cavity so i think you are clear with the communications next we will this is a short picture of the communications okay so i already explained so next we will go on to the fissures in the normal lateral there are only two fissures here pterygo maxillary fissure and inferior orbital fissure you know the pterygo maxillary fissure present between the lateral pterygoid plate and posterior surface of maxilla so this mainly transmits the third part of the maxillary artery from infra temporal fossa to pterygo palatine fossa you know the maxillary artery is the content of infra temporal fossa so the it has three part the third part is a content of the pterygo palatine fossa and the next one will be maxillary no so it enter the pterygo palatine fossa through foramen rotundum and posterior superior alveolar vessels and nerves are branches of maxillary no you can see in the pterygo maxillary fissure so other than this you can see the pterygoid venous plexus okay so i think you are clear about pterygo maxillary fissure so the next fissure will be the inferior orbital fissure so it lies at the junction of the floor of the orbit and lateral wall of the orbit so it mainly transmits the maxillary nerve it is uh, um, terminal part of maxillary nerve infra orbital vessels and zygomatic nerve and one vein which connects inferior ophthalmic vein with the pterygoid venous plexus okay so with this i'll finish the uh, normal lateralis okay so we have seen uh, different regions of normal lateralis one is first is the temporal fossa next will be the zygomatic arch then next will be the external acoustic meatus and fourth will be the stylomastoid region in that we have seen the mastoid styloid part then next we is we have seen about the infra temporal fossa then pterygo palatine fossa and mainly two fissures pterygo maxillary fissure and inferior orbital fissure okay so uh, uh, with this i'll finish the class if okay